And this event is um, uh, an event of ECSP's HELPS program. Uh, I'm learning my way around all the acronyms. Um, it's the Environmental Change and Security Program's Health, Environment, Livelihood, Population, and Security Program, uh, which is generously funded by the Office of Population and Reproductive Health of USAID. And um, I'd like to welcome Scott Radloff and Alan Starberg uh, to, for being here. For those of you who don't know, this is the official presidential memorial to our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson, who is the only president to have a PhD. <coughs> so the mission of the center is to try to bring together the world of ideas and world of public affairs, and that's exactly what uh, we hope will happen uh, here today. So um, I, I want to welcome all of you. I want to uh, extend an apology. Um, we had hoped that this would have been a little bit better organized, but uh, again, to go back to my, my Russian experience, it's often the least organized moments that are the most interesting. So <laughs> we, we hope that that will be the way it is today. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Karen Hardy, Senior Fellow of the Futures Group, who is going to be chairing. But before I do, I want to thank everybody associated with uh, what we call the green team here in, in the Wilson Center. This hasn't been an easy day, and um, they've really worked hard to try to make it as effortless as it can be. So thank you all, and the floor is now over to the panel. Thank you, Blair, and thank you, uh, really, thank you, the Wilson Center, for hosting this. Um, I, the, uh, a lot of us have a lot to learn about the London Summit and its follow-up. So uh, to have this opportunity so, so soon afterwards really is a, is a pleasure. And as we know, on July 11th um, the, at the Family Planning Summit in London, we witnessed the articulation of an extraordinary commitment among world leaders and civil society spearheaded by Melinda Gates and also the UK government and others, UNFPA, IPPF, and many organizations in this room for a renewed focus on family planning and for reaching an ambitious target of 120 million new family planning users by 2020. We heard extraordinary commitments of funding from donors, 2.6 billion, and, and uh, funding commitments from countries, but also commitments to look at policies and programs to expand them, to expand access to family planning. Now we have an opportunity uh, that we, we were told that London was the wedding and now we're in the marriage. Uh, and we have the opportunity now and really a challenge to transform family planning programming to reach that goal of 120 million new users. We need to do so, um, expand access really in unprecedented innovative ways, but also to ensure that we do so in ways that respect the rights that have been enshrined in family planning program over the decades and have particularly been reinforced over the last 20 years since ICPD in Cairo. Since the summit, some have questioned the, uh, the, the coexistence of an ambitious numeric target uh, with adherence to voluntary rights-based family planning. So today we have four uh, speakers who really have unique perspectives on the London Summit and on reaching the goals of what's now called FP 2020. Three of our speakers, actually f all four speakers, have been actively involved in the planning, both for the summit and also in its implementation. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them because you have bios of all of the four speakers and we want to um, preserve all, as much time for discussion as we can. Our first speaker will be Julia Bunting. As the UK government's lead for the Family Planning Summit, uh, she brings the perspective of the UK government. She's currently team leader on the AIDS and reproductive health team at DFID, but after 12 years will soon be leaving to join the International Planned Parenthood Federation of Director of Programs and Technical. So Julia will still remain intimately involved in the Family Planning Summit. Our second speaker will be uh, Wynne Brown, <coughs> Senior Program Officer for Measurement and Learning in Family Health Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Wynne started in, in January and his interview at the Bill uh, Gates Foundation probably didn't even include the words Family Planning Summit, so he got <laughs> launched right into this. Um, but comes with a great background, um, most recently from PEPFAR in South Africa, PEPFAR's biggest uh, um, PEPFAR program working on strategic information, um, but also a uh, long uh, career teaching at uh, School of Public Health in Michigan on family planning. And um, when co-chairs with Nell Drews at DFID, the Monitoring and Accountability Working Group. 
Wynn will be followed by uh, Scott Radloff, who in this room, of course, needs no introduction, who's, been the, who's the director of the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID's Global Health Bureau and has been in that position since 2006, but been at, has been at AID for 28 years. And of course, we know that the U.S. government has been a multi-decade uh, donor, the biggest donor, really, and supporter of family planning. So Scott manages the, the largest donor portfolio of family planning assistant, which, assistance, which is now about $550 million annually, um, and coordinates this program with other donors and civil society and countries. And he, of course, has worked closely with colleagues of <coughs> DFID and the Gates Foundation on the Family Planning Summit and, and its implementation. And our final speaker, I told Jill she's our mop-up speaker. She's going to add words of wisdom to put it all into perspective for us. Um, as the founder and president of Women Deliver, um, an international advocacy organization that convenes global leaders to galvanize action on maternal health and women's empowerment. Uh, so again, we'll have words of wisdom as we're trying to do the same in, in family planning. And Jill, of course, uh, was the founder of um, Family Care International and was also among the few civil society representatives of the UN Secretary General's Global Strategy on Women's and Children's Health. So let's hear from our speakers and uh, then we'll have lots of time for discussion. Julia? Great. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction and thank you to Blair and the staff here at the Wilson Center for hosting this important meeting today. It's a genuine privilege to be here with you all. Um, we were all asked to give about 15 minutes presentations, but in discussions with the staff here suggested that we might want to shorten that because I think the real benefit is the interaction that we can have in the discussion. So I'm just going to give a few minutes overview, um, setting out the background for the summit for those who aren't already familiar and setting where we are at the moment and where we hope to be going in the future. So as Karen um, highlighted, the London summit was held on the 11th of July and it brought together a range of stakeholders, um, most importantly country governments, over 20 country governments from developing countries are represented, uh, donor agencies and foundations, private sector, civil society and many others coming together with this bold ambition to uh, meet the needs of family planning, voluntary family planning for the women in the world's poorest countries. And we came up with the, the target of 120 million additional users. It was done through a lot of work, um, including with many experts who really helped to understand what the data was showing, where we've achieved progress in the past, um, the fact that progress has actually been off track in the last few years. Uh, unmet need, as many will know, has remained very high, uh, and the increased access has, has been slowing down. So the summit was really about bringing together all the people who work on these issues with a clear commitment to, to really start to now transform the field, recognizing that for too long it had been an issue that many people were not prepared to talk about, was caught up in all sorts of politics, uh, small <laughs> p and big p politics. Um, but what we really wanted to do was to put it back on the public health agenda, really focus on the public health reality of the impact of not having access to voluntary family planning information services and supplies had on the lives of women. And we all know the statistics, the impact of maternal mortality, maternal morbidity, high levels of unintended pregnancies, unsafe abortions. And what the summit was really trying to do was to make sure that people understood that family planning, access to contraception, is a public health benefit. And we need to really support women in being able to choose freely and for themselves whether, when, and how many children they have. What was really important was that it focused on trying to make it this sort of public health reality, putting it in that, that context, um, addressing the unmet need, looking at the impact that has on, on women's health and, and, and their lives. As I say, it brought together a, a number of partners. Karen highlighted that the donors contributed some $2.6 billion worth of commitments, which is unprecedented over the next eight years. But for me, what was really important was the number of country governments themselves that attended and made bold and ambitious commitments on a range of sort of policy financing and delivery that will enable them to meet the needs of women in, in their countries. And I think the finances is whilst important, it was one of the key headlines, it's only very much a part of the solution for those who work in this field recognize that there's only so far we can go with more money. What we really need to focus on is some of the demand side uh, aspects, some of the other barriers that limit women's access to comprehensive services that can't be addressed purely by just throwing more money at the problem. But obviously the money helps to solve some of those problems. Uh, as Karen highlighted, we talked a lot about the wedding and the marriage and the, that phrasing came out from a conversation I had with Gary Darmstad at the foundation uh, back in the very dark days of January um, when we were first approaching the Gates Foundation to join with the UK government in this endeavour. 
and the Gates colleagues were really clear that they didn't just want to do a, a big kind of political jamboree, they wanted real substance. And I made the comment, you have to think about this short term and long term. Short term, big important day, everybody comes together, joins in a celebration of the issue and what they want to do. But the really important bit is the eight years or so afterwards where we actually have to now get down to delivery. And so two months on from the summit, we're now at that point where we have to really sit down and work through exactly what does this mean. As Karen noted, whilst the summit was important for the UK and Gates and, and many of the others, including US and UNFPA and others in bringing it together, this is an area that a lot of people have been working on for many years. And as we know, um, USAID has been at the vanguard of this uh, agenda for the last 50 years. And uh, the finance that, the, that the, the US government provides outnumbers everybody else um, collectively, I think, probably. Uh, so it's about working through existing systems, existing partners, all the other people around the table. And for me, it's really about the power of partnership, about bringing people together who can make a difference, who can help solve problems, who can help overcome barriers to meet the needs of women and making sure that we retain that at the centre, supporting the fundamental right of women to, for women to be able to choose for themselves. That's really what it's all about. Obviously, lots of work going on. A few of us in this room are heading up to New York um, this evening, tomorrow, for two days of meetings to really think through how we start to deliver this. We've got a lot already in place, but there's a lot further to go. And it would be good to hear from you today as we go into the question and answer what you see as the issues we need to think about, what you see as some of the solutions are that we should be seeking to, to implement. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> please. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here. Thank you so much to the Wilson Center for hosting this event. Thank you, Karen, for agreeing to chair what is going to be probably um, a rather raucous debate as we get through with the panel. Uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, I've got a PowerPoint. I, I work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and there you actually have to use PowerPoint. <laughs> and I will try not to be critical of PowerPoint, because I actually work for the man who brought us PowerPoint. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. Yeah, from beginning. Thank you. So, Julia, th thanks, thanks for the introduction, Julia. Um, it gives me a bit of a head start. I, I too, uh, uh, I've got ten slides. Um, I, I too will try to make it quite brief. Um, uh, I, I, I really do think that we can use this time. I think we've got about two hours to to generate a discussion about what we can talk about in the upcoming New York meetings. That's very much a post. Uh, um, July 11 planning meeting, where, where, where are we now? Um, wh there's a lot of implementation to be done. What does the governance structure look like? Who do we reach out to? How do we turn um, this into really, uh, I know it sounds trite, but how, how do we sort of generate a, a global family planning m movement? That's, that's, that's probably what this is all about. Um, my rather tedious piece is going to be just on the, the, the monitoring part, and I, 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 I'm hoping that by going through some slides that, that um, details some of the monitoring challenges, we can sort of uh, generalize from there and talk about some of the procedural issues and so some of the values that we want to reflect in our program, and also um, a bit about how, how, how we think we're going to be implementing really a very large global, not so much global project with contractual terms, but again, a global m movement, um, probably much, a little <coughs> bit more along the lines of an UNGAS process, a sort of Gavi structure, sort of not one donor-specific project, but something that's quite global. So I thought, um, let's take a look at the, the monitoring the, mo the monitoring problems, what, are we, what do we think we're going to monitor? What, what, what do this sort of uh, the larger planning people think that they're going to monitor? How do we reach out to all the groups who are already doing the monitoring and, and the challenges therein? And, and I thought, um, since we have, um, <clears throat> since I, I just have 10 slides, um, I thought that by showing you these three domains of the, of the monitoring problem, we can, we can sort of uh, get we get to the heart of the matter to talk about, about, talk about the things that have challenged us since we started doing the monitoring back, yes, back when I just joined the foundation. Um, and uh, so sorry, I'm going to have to be a little bit brief, and uh, so I'll, I'll have to skip over the really beautiful details of all the <laughs> Wednesday morning monitoring accountability we're working through calls that we have with about 25 demographers and human rights people and program people. You were on those calls. Uh, we, um, uh, but we'll, uh, maybe they'll come out later. So. Uh, I, I 
susceptive use, contraceptive data, contraceptive choice. I think this is sort of the triangle. We're trying to find our way in all of these things as we get to sort of a measurement model. Um, not our measurement model, but sort of the measurement model, the sort of global measurement model. And I think <clears throat> we have to start with the uh, somewhat, in, in, according to some constituencies, the somewhat troubling fact that the, you know, the, in, in London, I mean, much of what we talked about was anchored by an overarching quantitative goal, and it looks like this. You probably, a lot of you have probably already seen this line graph. Um, uh, you know, the, we have a London family planning the summit goal of 120 million additional women using modern methods of contraception. So MCPR is sort of the, the indicator that we're talking about. Uh, Julia, <coughs> Julia mentioned sort of where, where the metrics came from. Uh, this is what we've got. Um, we have to talk about sort of the purpose of the, of the uh, London July 11 day, sort of a very important day to sort of show the world that we're going to re-energize this family planning field, come up with un unprecedented commitments on the part of donors and governments. Now we're in the marriage. <clears throat> um, it, it is hard work. Uh, but this, this goal really is, is about is about taking um, the, MC, the historical progress of, modern, of the modern contraceptive prevalence rate from all the surveys and the data that we have, and uh, that's, that, that's that sort of the, the lower part of that line, and trying to raise that line up. So a lot of what we're trying to do in a measurement sense, in a very strictly measurement sense, is, is to increase the slope of that line. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask, you know, in many ways, what's, what's wrong with this picture? You know, what, is, what, what is wrong with this picture? We, we, we've shown this slide to lots of, audi of, of audiences. There is a reaction. <laughs> there doesn't appear to be a reaction here. That's okay. <laughs> It'll come. Um, let, let, me, let me try to be sort of preemptive. <laughs> uh, I, I would first ask, and I'll, I'll pose these questions, and we'll cover them in the, in the Q&A session. So what, what, what might be wrong with this picture? First, why, why MCPR? Why not, as Julia said, why not unmet need? So we'll think about that one. You know, why not unmet need? Very, very attractive s s sort of a measure in, along the main dimensions. Why 2020 as a time frame? Why not something maybe that's five years, or why not a time frame that's much, much l l longer? I think that's an easier question, but it's been raised. Um, why? Why a quantitative goal relating, related to contraceptive use in the first place? Because that, that does potentially conjure up images of sort of vertical, top-down, target-driven programs where questions of voluntary family planning, possibly coercion, come, come, come into play. That's a critical issue. And I think whenever we post this particular slide, that's part of the reaction that, that comes out. And then finally, I guess I would say, and um, this is a real data question, how, how do we know that the 260 million women users at the 2012 mark is valid? How, where, where do these numbers come from? You're, you should be asking, how valid are, how valid are these data? Um, so let's, let's go to contraceptive data. This is slide, <coughs> slide five of 10, so we're already halfway there. So do, do, we, do we have the data that we need to produce 12-month estimates of modern contraceptive prevalence. And uh, I think a, a lot of the, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people who have been, been, been in the field a long time and they're shaking their head, you know, we may have these data, we, we're gonna have to work hard to get to these data. So this, this slide here is a sort of a mock for, a mo for, 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 for any of the large countries that, are, that w went to L London and that made commitments. This, this is probably what their data schedule looks like, in other words, most of the countries that we work with for all these years have a DHS scheduled, or more, more than one DHS scheduled, and so many of our, um, of our statistics, so much of what we talk about, almost our, <clears throat> our currency when we talk about family planning is from the DHS. I love the DHS. A lot of us got our doctorates working on the DHS. I'm looking at my f fellow doctoral students. Um, I know there are people here from the DHS. Thank you for coming. But um, 
The DHS only, only comes in any particular country every five years, generally speaking, and it, it, it's, it's a huge effort. It's, it's a population-based survey. It tends to pitch estimates at the national level. R rarely do they um, come up with estimates that go much below the level of a national estimate. And we probably are talking, I'm taking shortcuts here, we're, we're probably talking about a, a monitoring problem where we would, um, we would want to, in a sense, tell the world on a 12-month schedule, how are we doing? So where, where do we get those data to come up with sort of numbers of women using modern methods of contraception? Not new users, just users. Um, we'll talk about that later. So uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UK government, USAID, a lot of donors are really keen on coming up with creative ways to use uh, program data, service statistics, creative ways to uh, use the DHS in different ways. Uh, uh, I, I, um, we've talked about a lot of these things. I'm, uh, I've talked with a, a, a lot of the people here in, in this room about various approaches. Um, <laughs> please, please email me with your proposals <laughs> <laughs> about how we do this. It's really very important that we, in a sense, change the paradigm a, a, a little bit so that we, we, we move away from what I would say is an over-dependence on the DHS and get to a point where we're really uh, working in the realm of service statistics, like the, the, those data that come out of government, uh, you know, HMIS, MIS. Very hard to do, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can get to that point. And here's some other, I list some other possible approaches to coming up with much more rapid ways to assess M MCPR. <clears throat> That's the data part. Uh, and then choice is, um, is something that we, we didn't talk a lot about in the very early days of, the, uh, of the, the, the working group where we had to frankly come up with a sort of a, a baseline number for, um, for MCPR. But very, very quickly, it, was, it, it started, started our, our conversation started to be all about contraceptive choice. How, you know, holding ourselves accountable to core values of quality, quality of, uh, of, of care. The, the equity issue means re reaching the people who we think need to be reached for, for on any number of dimensions. Human rights, the uh, extent to which all the work that we're going to be doing in family planning links to the MNCH work, links to uh, all the sexual, the reproductive health work, links to all the other sectoral work that's going on. And then, of course, voluntary family planning. So, and so the question is, you know, how, how, do we, how do the measurement people make sure that what they come up with in terms of the indicators that we use to document progress re reflect those values? What, one way to th think about this, not the only way, one way to, th to think about this is to go way back to the Br uh, Bruce Jane framework. Um, and we have talked about this. It's, 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 it's not an old model. There, there have been critiques of the um, Bruce Jane qu um, quality of care model through, through the years. We've seen lots of iterations of it. I do think it's a nice fr fr framework. I think it's a point of, a it's, it's a point of departure, maybe, for how, how we make sure that we're, um, we're pitching the, the measures that we need at the sort of provider-client level with a strong community-based component to it. And these six dimensions of the Bruce Jane framework, I think, are all critical for how we uh, approach a, a, a measurement model. How are programs doing? How the way in individuals and clients are treated by this system providing services. <clears throat> and so um, just two, two more slides so that, you know, al along those lines, I, you know, we have to make sure that no matter what we come up with, uh, the monitoring that we do very, very much has to align and link with, in very concrete terms, link with the every woman, every child. Um, a monitoring stream that's already been developed, uh, the MDG, the e extent to which the sort of the big global programs that we do have to in, in, inform the monitoring of the MDGs. We have to align with what the, country, with what the countries are al already doing. I'm just speaking about the monitoring. The countries have their own plans. They have their own monitoring systems, approaches, protocols. So we definitely don't want to create another dreaded <laughs> parallel structure. That's key. Um, a lot of us have worked in that parallel structure model, and it's not a nice place to live. Um, 
uh, I think we talked a bit about we really have to pitch, cer cer certainly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is keen on trying to find ways to um, make data, make quality data more available to come up with the measures that we need. For, so re real, real, I hope there's a lot of energy around being, you know, creative with the measurements that we need. We definitely need to sort of talk about all, and Julia mentioned this, and we're, it's a reaching out process. It's connecting all those dots. It's making sure that the measurement people who are normally sort of um, way down at the end of the hallway in some dark room, I mean, we want to be in the, the middle of everything uh, linked with all the other groups out there. It's, you know, it's, it's a very sort of co collective process that we're talking about. And, you know, finally, the measurement and the indicators that we come up with have to reflect core values, the rights, choice, voluntary family planning, quality of care, transparency of, of data. I think if we do all those things, and this is the last slide, I think if we do all those things, then rather, rather than these three domains being sort of a bit of a question mark, how do we do this, are we stuck with contraceptive use as an unfavorable sort of indicator slash target? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, are we stuck with contraceptive data that won't help us to m monitor progress? No, I don't think we are. Uh, do the measurement people have the ability, the willingness to reach out to the other groups who are sort of ho holders of the, of, the, of the core values of our field and make sure that the measurements that we pitch are are completely aligned with human rights, with choice, with voluntary family planning. I, I actually think that'll make for the strongest kinds of indicators that we can possibly have. If we do those things, then I believe that we'll have a very, a very strong success in generating a, a global monitoring movement. Thank you very much. Wynn and Scott are just going to switch, switch places. Yeah. Uh, right. so. Great. So I want to join my colleagues in uh, thanking the Woodrow Wilson Center for sponsoring this event uh, today and to Karen for uh, chairing um, and for all of you for attending. Um, I'm going to come at this a little bit differently. I'm going to talk about um, the London Summit and what it means for USAID. And in doing so, I'm going to provide a little of uh, historical content where the summit fits into the history of what we all know as the um, international family planning movement. So I've always said that there are um, three key ingredients to successful family planning programs. You'll see them in the three boxes here. Commitment, resources, and know-how. And starting with uh, commitment, uh, there needs to be a commitment to family planning at the international level, uh, among donors, among international organizations. There needs to be commitment at the country level with governments, NGO leaders, private sector leaders, health leaders, development leaders. Um, there needs to be commitment at the local level, at uh, regional district levels, and down to the community level. And engaging community leaders is, uh, is clearly uh, essential for successful programming. And then the final note I have here is that it needs to be sustained. To move countries from low levels of contraceptive access and use to high levels of contraceptive access and, and use takes time. Uh, normally it takes 20 years if you have uh, um, good success. So uh, the commitment needs to be sustained. Secondly, um, there's a need for resources. From the local governments themselves need to be financing uh, family planning work, private sector and non-government organizations as well. Donors have an important role to play, foundations, bilateral donors, multilateral donors. And then I put civil society down here and the very important advocacy role that they play in helping to generate resources. And I probably should put civil society in uh, each of these boxes because they also play a role in uh, galvanizing uh, commitment and on the know-how side to um, ensure that best practices are adopted and that quality of care is, um, is um, preserved in our programs. And then finally, the third box is the know-how. And uh, we have um, 
over 40 years of um, experience in working in family planning. We know what the um, componentry of, of successful family planning's, planning programs are, uh, including uh, training, supervision, communications, uh, pu supporting public and private channels of service delivery, uh, monitoring, et cetera. Um, part of know-how is also um, innovation, <clears throat> and that includes innovation and new technologies for um, new methods of contraception, but also um, new and innovative ways of delivering, um, monitoring, and uh, supporting service deliver uh, services. Um, <coughs> I note uh, high impact practices. This has been a focus of our work over the past few years in identifying what are the high impact practices that can be adopted and adapted um, across the countries we work in. Um, and we've come a long way in uh, developing those. Uh, and then finally, uh, utilization and scale up. So uh, the best um, approaches, um, the proven approaches need to be um, uh, adequately utilized and scaled up if they're going to have any impact. So just um, <clears throat> looking at the history of um, the family planning um, movement, um, and I've, um, I've sorted these into um, three uh, broad eras. Um, and the first one being um, <coughs> from the early 1960s uh, to around 1995 when family planning received um, broad priority attention um, across the donor community, international community, and across many countries as well. And this was a time of dramatic uh, growth in uh, donor attention and funding. It's a time when uh, UNFPA was established, for example, and regular international conferences were held. Um, there was uh, early um, policies, commitment, and resources uh, garnered for family planning, especially in Latin America, Asia, and North Africa, um, such that by the early 1990s, um, uh, USAID began graduating countries from assistance uh, in those particular uh, regions. It actually started maybe in the late 1980s, but um, continued um, uh, into the 1990s. Um, such that today, I think we've graduated now 22 countries from assistance. Um, and during that period of time, also the demographic, uh, along with the health rationale, were the uh, primary rationales for family planning. Now, that period of time for era one is, is 30 years, and that's maybe a long time for an era, and, uh, and perhaps it could be subdivided into a period of very rapid ramp up that goes into the, from the beginning until the, um, um, maybe mid-1980s, and then a period of more or less uh, stabilization, so not a whole lot of growth in resources, but um, continued attention. Era two is a period of uh, growing neglect, uh, beginning in 1996, around, around then, until around 2008. Uh, donor attention shifts during this period to other health priorities. Um, there was increased use of uh, basket funding approaches uh, among many donors, and uh, which um, many times left out family planning or had, we had a hard time during that period knowing exactly what was happening with family planning under those approaches, uh, maybe more so in some countries than others. Um, it was also a, a growing disparity between middle and low income countries where we had our greatest success or countries that are now in the middle income categories uh, with less progress in the low income countries. Uh, USAID um, funding declines um, from our 1995 peak in the late 1990s, our funding was cut by one-third and then rebounded a little bit in the early 2000s, but um, that certainly had an impact on program implementation. Um, and it was during this period that, um, that rights and the rights alongside the health rationale became primary and the demographic uh, perhaps faded into the background a bit. And then the third area, um, 2009, 2008, 2009, um, through what we hope will be uh, 2020 and perhaps beyond, um, a period of growing attention and partnerships around family planning. Um, U.S. government funding uh, and attention increased under, under the Global Health Initiative. Family planning was elevated alongside maternal child health and nutrition as priorities um, for uh, health programs. Um, we, um, uh, both DFID and um, 
The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, began to exert uh, greater leadership, uh, culminating in the July 11th um, um, Family Planning Summit in London. Um, and the attention um, over this period has increasingly focused on the high need, low income countries of um, Africa and South Asia. Um, and also I would say in this period um, that continued attention to um, rights and the health rationale, but, uh, but also a growing recognition of the uh, demographic and economic uh, impacts, particularly uh, age structure and the impacts that, uh, on family, family level well-being. So um, what I just reviewed is the three era eras of uh, fam the family planning um, uh, movement um, plays itself out in, um, in funding levels over time. So um, uh, this is drawing upon a couple of different uh, databases that track donor funding uh, and uh, have been blended together in a way that I think um, uh, is re reasonably accurate. Um, but you can see um, these are cumulative funding levels by uh, donors uh, by decades. Uh, and you'll see that, uh, that actually there was some funding provided in the 1950s. I think this, this was um, uh, foundation uh, funding, Rockefeller and Ford in particular, and perhaps some others. Um, and then in the 1960s, you'll see um, uh, almost a billion dollars across the 1960s. So you've got to divide this by 10 to get to the sort of the annualized average, so about $100 million a year in the 1960s. And then you'll see it growing um, more than quadrupling by the 1970s to 4.4 billion, or $440 million per year. Um, and then the 1980s, it um, uh, stabilized a bit, but then growth again in the 1990s to um, $8.5 billion. Um, and then you see the fall off, um, the neglect that I had mentioned in the previous slide um, funding reducing down to around $7 billion for the decade of the 2000s. Um, and then the 2010s is, uh, is premised on the uh, commitments that we heard in, uh, in London actually coming through, and you'll see the rebound uh, for family planning. So this is what we're all here to talk about, and uh, how can we make this, these, uh, this larger investment and um, um, recommitment and revitalization of family planning most, um, most effective. Um, this top panel is based on um, current dollars, and just below that I have another panel that shows those same funding numbers, but uh, in real dollar terms. So it's all indexed to 1985 dollars, and you can see the picture changes a bit. So if you, if you control for inflation, you can see clearly that the 1970s was the year of the, uh, of, of the largest levels of funding. Um, for family planning uh, programs. And the countries that were ready to um, uh, commit themselves and to work on family planning, I think, were the main beneficiaries. All those graduate countries that we see now from uh, Asia and Latin America, et cetera, are the ones that took advantage of that. Then, um, so if you look at the, then the funding fell off in the 1980s, rebounded a bit in the 90s, and you still see the fall off in the 2000s and the rebound in, uh, in the 2010s. Um, uh, which is still an impressive uh, rebound, even in um, uh, uh, controlling for um, inflation. So um, the U.S. and USG, USAID uh, uh, were one of the organizations involved in the planning for the summit, and are involved in um, uh, in helping to uh, steer the uh, the work of the p uh, summit partners as we go forward. Um, the um, U.S. government was represented by uh, our administrator, USAID administrator Rajiv Shah, uh, who chaired a don donor panel uh, at the summit. Um, and we were also represented by the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, uh, via videotape, who uh, sent a message uh, to the summit uh, participants. Um, so, um, you know, the U.S. government has a difficult time of making out your commitments. Our budgets are um, are uh, crafted year by year, and uh, so um, we didn't have a, uh, we weren't able to make a commitment over the eight years of the summit uh, time frame, uh, but we were able to say that we um, uh, want to build on commitments that were made at the Child Survival Call to Action, which preceded the London Summit by about a month, 
and the Child Survival Call to Action encompasses all of the interventions that impact on uh, child survival, uh, including family planning. So family planning was featured in that summit. Um, our commitment was to remain the leading donor for family planning, uh, and we note that our funding had incre has increased under the Global Health Initiative by 40 percent, from 470 million per year to 640 million annually, so we remain the largest donor in family planning. Uh, we committed to strengthening partnerships with governments, donors, and the private sector as we go forward. Uh, partnership is a, uh, one of the principles under the Global Health Initiative, uh, so something we want to um, encourage and build on. Um, we committed to continue to play a leading role in new contraceptive development with a focus on technologies that both uh, prevent pregnancy and HIV STI transmission. Um, we also announced a partnership with DFID and the Gates Foundation to expand access to uh, a new contraceptive product, FO sub Q, in Uniject uh, in five to six countries. Um, and then we uh, also um, announced the uh, Statement for Collective Action for Postpartum Family Planning, which we co-led with uh, WHO in developing uh, to encourage uh, integration of family planning services with maternal child health services and to maximize the health impacts of family planning. And you can see the statement there on the lower right. I think there are 14 uh, international organizations and donors that have signed on to this uh, uh, call to action. So what are the summit uh, implications for USAID and USAID's implementing partners? I have a number of ideas that uh, I'll present here. Um, one is that um, it means expanding the circle of commitments and voices to family planning. I think in the, in the 2000s, we kind of felt like we were um, a lonely voice uh, on family planning around the world and uh, maybe kind of a quiet voice at that. Um, but um, uh, this enables um, um, USAID to join with others in um, uh, committing to uh, family planning. Um, the, um, the Family Planning Summit uh, focused on, um, focuses attention on countries where uh, we have the highest unmet need. Um, and um, uh, so in many cases, maybe not all cases, but in many cases, the work of the summit partners will um, will focus on countries that uh, uh, will dovetail with where USAID already is. So there are opportunities for, um, for synerg synergies there and, um, on, and building uh, upon what's already underway. Um, USAID um, has had a long ex uh, experience in um, new innovation and high impact practices around family planning, and those uh, provide an opportunity to tap on those and to build upon those through the um, um, summit um, uh, follow on, follow up. Um, USAID uh, and our partners can also assist countries in developing effective plans for expanding access that can be uh, utilized in, um, in summit follow up as well. Um, working in partnership is, um, is key to the success of the London summit. And as I mentioned, it's a priority for, uh, for USAID and it's something that we um, feel we've, um, um, we've We've established in many ways, but more uh, certainly could be done. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, just to say that this is an un unprecedented precedent opportunity for progress in Africa and South Asia, particularly the countries that didn't benefit from the first um, revolution around family planning. So this is an opportunity to make progress where, uh, uh, where we haven't made much progress in the last um, 40 years. So I'm going to close by... Um, just reading um, a portion of the statement that was in the, uh, that Hillary Clinton delivered at the London summit. Reproductive rights are basic human rights. Women everywhere should have the right to decide when and whether to have children. But too often, in too many places around the world, these rights are denied. Millions of women and young people across the globe don't have access to modern forms of contraception. Today, you are demonstrating the solidarity of the international community behind a woman's right to make decisions about the timing, number, and spacing of her children, which is critical to the advancement of women, their families, and their communities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Scott. Jill? 
Thank you so much. I really thank you to the Wilson Center for having us all here today because what happened in London on the 11th was absolutely extraordinary. Thank you to Karen for asking me and for, for chairing this group. I was asked to talk about what I saw and what I heard, to put a little meat on, on some of these really important framework bones that we've been hearing about. The London Summit was just simply a phenomenal event that put family planning squarely at the top of the political agenda. There are heroes in this room, and I'm not going to list them because there are a lot of them who spent probably weeks without sleep. But the truth is that they are truly heroes because we've needed them to go without that sleep for quite a while, as Scott showed us on, on those great graphs. It was really important and great to remind the world of the importance of family planning to girls, to women, and to people absolutely all over this planet. To me, the event was a booster dose for family planning, a booster shot. I'm not quite sure what doctors call it, but it's a, it was a real boost. It was a major <coughs> shot in the arm that injected life and political will into this issue after too long of too much and too great neglect. Let's face it, MDG 5 is still the furthest behind. It's the most off track, the least funded of all MDGs, partly because governments around the world have seen family planning as far too political. They weren't ready to risk it. Now, there may be a penalty if they don't risk it. Girls and women especially have suffered from this neglect because honestly if women can't plan their fertility they can't plan their lives. The summit took a bold step forward. The summit confirmed that this is an essential issue. It set ambitious goals many of which for themselves, they've really already achieved. Imagine, the summit raised over 2.6 B for billion dollars and gained commitments from donors, all kinds of donors and governments worldwide. The outcome of this event, if it works, is to enable 120 girls and women in the world's poorest countries access to contraceptive information, services, and decisions. But you know what? The success of the, of the summit wasn't just about money. Money's important. Resources are money, but there are a lot of other things too. I want you to keep that in mind. I'm not sniveling at 2.6 billion because it's phenomenal. It's just that there are other pieces when you talk about resources. The summit represented an amazing mixture of communities, governments, civil society, the private sector. Some of the usual suspects, a lot of new now suspects. It was a melting pot of perspectives. And that was exactly what we needed at exactly that time to move the needle on family planning. Not one of us sectors or individuals or agencies can do this alone. We're only going to achieve progress by doing this together. Civil society played a really nice and important role do you know, I bet you do, that 1,300 organizations worldwide came together under the leadership of the IPPF to support a civil society declaration? That was astounding. In fact, they took 
a page in that Financial Times, and it almost could say nothing but simply list the organization. <clears throat> that spoke volumes, just that by itself. Civil society has got to continue to play a crucial role as partners in policy making, but holding governments accountable to advocate for comprehensive programs and yes, really work to protect human rights. At the summit, I was particularly awed by several leaders who got it just right. David Cameron, imagine. Sorry, but a major conservative. I just didn't think this would happen. David Cameron was spectacular. He gave a speech that was so full of passion and determination, using the right facts in the right way. He knows that family planning is just the first step, but it's an essential step on a long journey toward growth and equality and development. And he said loud and clear, Every woman should be able to decide her own future. Like, how revolutionary is that? <laughs> I, I confess that I also loved his answer to the question from the floor about the Roman Catholic Church. It was a very straight, bald question. And you need to look at the tape or listen to the tape to get the full impact of what he was saying. What he basically said was, that we're all chicken. We have evidence that shows that family planning saves lives. Yet, organized religion, not just the Catholic Church, but organized religion tells us it's wrong. He said it is wrong for women to lose their lives when we know how to save them. Really, could you just imagine the head of state saying that? Julia, really? <laughs> Phenomenal. All right, the other person who was a hero was the Norwegian Development Cooperation oh, Minister. Unbelievable. So we loved this man. He was young. He was under the table when his mother, an ardent feminist, was negotiating for all sorts of things for women in Norway. So he said, all this information you're talking about, I grew up on <laughs> hiding under the table as I went with my mother to these meetings. In addition, Norway solidified their position as a really strong partner and supporter with an impressive $200 million <laughs> commitment. So, President Joyce Banda of Malawi was my third of the trifecta. She was so great. She was strong, she was real, and she was absolutely firm in her determination. The government of Malawi is committed to increasing contraception rate by 60% by 2020. That's a lot. She's also going to focus on ages 15 to 24. And to do this, they're raising the age of marriage to 18 and strengthening sexual and reproductive health programs for young people. Like, like isn't she a hero? There were new champions joining the fight. Maybe not everybody knows this, but President Museveni of Uganda had not uttered the words family planning in public. He said it six times <laughs> at the family planning summit. We, yes, we were counting. And he did it and he believed it. We know his wife has believed it for a long time. He's now on record and it's fabulous because Uganda has almost 40% unmet need for family planning. He came forward with new commitments. He committed this is no small thing for Uganda. Five million dollars, up from one million, for the next five years toward improving reproductive health services. To me, the summit was a seriously legitimizing moment. Every sector, every region 
stood tall behind family planning. This is the support that's been missing, and here it was public. It was a gorgeous, bright, sunny day. There were cameras, there were recordings, and it happened. So I'm not going to take time to remind you of the evidence that supports investing in family planning. I'm sure all of you have those wonderful cards, which I just love, from the Alan Guttmacher Institute. They really, I've probably passed out 100,000 of them different places because it draws the very close bind between family planning and what it would do to reduce maternal mortality, which is a particular interest of women deliver, not surprising. But it's important to remember that there are still 220 million girls and women around the world who don't have access to that information or services and many of those girls and women are going to die in pregnancy and childbirth. Closing the gap, that gap for unmet need, is a good investment. And you know what else? It's a smart investment. It's the right investment. Because when women survive, families and nations do thrive. The good news is that we do know what to do, at least a good part of it to get us started. The number of maternal deaths are on decline, and the number of contraceptive users is on the increase. Maternal deaths and disability are largely preventable, not 100%, but largely, but we're nowhere near there yet. They're tangible solutions. Family planning is the head of the list. Skill provision of care through all stages of pregnancy and childbirth, and safe abortion services. We have to start to look to the future and plan for that future. And that means prioritizing young people, which is a new frontier for a lot of the world. We have to make sure they have the resources, the services, the information and education that they need. Did you know there are nearly 3 billion young people in the world under 25? 3 billion, as our card for the Women Deliver Conference says, what that really is, is three billion opportunities. We need continued leadership. We need foot soldiers, and we need strong, visible leadership. The summit laid that groundwork and enlisted the support of us. We're mainly civil society here. And they enlisted that help across the globe we're inspired. I was so inspired, and I've worked at this a long time. It takes a lot to inspire me. <laughs> I really was inspired by the summit. And we've got to keep the momentum going. Its messages, its outcomes, they need to remain visible and in the forefront of what we do every single day. We need to set our sights high for two, two, 2020. There's a clear path which several of these speakers have helped get our toes on that path. We have to admit that our work's not going to be done in 2015, but we need to make significant progress so that we convince ourselves that it really can be done. I'd like us to be as charismatic and as bold and honestly as pragmatic as David Cameron was. He was just amazing, just amazing. We can't let the opposition control the argument. As he said, we have the evidence, so now use it. And we need to take every opportunity to rally support. This includes a small commercial for the Women Deliver Conference next May in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> Because day two of that conference will look precisely in the eye of unmet need and how we can together move that needle forward. The London summit represented a sea change in global thinking. Family planning that's universally accessible can ensure truly a changed global landscape 
for women and their families. So it's time. Invest in family planning because it pays. Invest in girls and women. It pays too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for our four speakers. Now we'd like to turn it over for questions and discussion, and this is going to be a bit chaotic also because we have, we're getting questions from the other uh, rooms too. So uh, because it's being recorded, you need a microphone. I see your hand, John. Say your first. Say your name. <laughs> Say your name and organization, and please keep your questions short because there will be many. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Uh, my name is John Townsend with the Population Council. Uh, I was in Senegal uh, the last couple of weeks for, to, to look at the plan of action for Senegal. And to put that in context, there's 12% prevalence, 30% unmet need, and 43% of, of, of the population is under 14 years old. That reflects pretty much what, uh, what, what Jill was talking about. This is something for the future. What, the, the things that impressed me, I think, by their plan of action, and this is where my question comes in, a focus on total market for health, not just the public sector or private sector looking at rights and justice, another way of talking about, uh, about choice and equity. Understanding that long-acting reversible contraception has to be part of an agenda. This isn't just sending more pills uh, to uh, Dakar. Uh, sustainable financing. Uh, what's the, what was promised in, in London wasn't really enough to keep this going, and we have to add families uh, as, as, as sources of, of resources for this because it pays off for them. And finally, kind of supporting uh, health systems in general, figuring out instead of a silo, how do we work towards actually supporting health care generally? I was, I, this is a new generation. Uh, the, the minister made an incredible statement uh, uh, in London, and she's, she's moving things forward. The, I had two questions. One, at the country level, how do we pick out 120 million new users doesn't mean much for Senegal. It's a small country but they're making efforts. We have to figure out where do we want to make this support and make sure that these five issues are, are available to other countries. And secondly, how do we make sure that this issue gets on the sustainable development goals uh, in the next agenda for beyond 2015? Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's take a, a, a couple of, a few questions and then we'll uh, turn to our speakers. Okay, Ed. And then we'll come over here to you too. Oh, great, okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Ed Barry with the Sustainable World Initiative. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my question is really for when. Uh, you asked uh, sort of rhetorically, how do we establish a global movement? Is your vision for the global movement just this 120 million goal, or is it beyond that? And then I'd reiterate the question that was just asked again. Do you have any plans to work with other NGOs to make sure that the uh, reproductive health concerns are brought into the SDGs as they're created. Thank you. Great, thanks. And now we're going to come over here. So we'll start with Suzanne and then Carlos and then Ellen. All right, thanks, Karen. Suzanne Petroni with the International Center for Research on Women. Um, and I want to thank the, the panelists not only for getting us to July 11th, uh, but also for including civil society in the planning. I was, I was watching from afar the planning and could certainly see the influence and your openness to the inputs of civil society as the, the planning for July happened. Um, and you all mentioned in your presentations the need to involve civil society. So I wanted to just uh, press a little bit further on, as, uh, on that and ask how specifically uh, you intend to engage civil society in the monitoring, uh, in the evaluation, in the accountability moving forward of, of the commitments. Great, thanks. Okay, Carlos, and then uh, and then Ellen, and then we'll come back to the panel for answers. Carlos Indacochea, George Washington University. I just want to add a footnote to Wynn's presentation. I would suggest that uh, our monitoring extends to the so-called uh, graduate countries. Oh, I, interesting. I am not mm -hmm. going to name any, but I'm starting to suspect they are behaving again like undergrads. <laughs> Interesting point, yeah. Thank you very much. I think a lot of the um, enthusiasm and excitement that there was at, at London really came through in, in the presentations you all made. Thank you. I wonder when we talk about unmet need and meeting the unmet need of these 120 million women, if we don't do ourselves a little bit of a disservice when we talk about those women as lacking access. Mm. Because mm -hmm. the answer to the question is that I am not using. And there are a lot of reasons women aren't using. Correct. I think as we try to really 
uh, solidify the focus on rights that does underlie the, uh, the intent of the summit. If we talk about it more broadly and open up the opportunity to really look at what those other obstacles are, I think we'll get further in meeting need and I think we can, um, we can diminish perhaps some of the concern that this is only about the numbers. Panelists, when a couple things were so pointed to you. Well, you're looking at me. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, thanks, John. You know, one of um, one of Monica Kerrigan's favorite places is is the Dakar family planning scene, and she spent a lot of time there. She's the she's the um, director of family planning strategy at. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. By the way, there is an announcement that we are in the recruitment process for a director, a higher level director for the newly <coughs> created family planning program at the foundation. So I'm sure that's going to be something we'll start talking about. Anyway, Francophone Africa and Dakar has loomed large in all of the metrics conversations that we've had. You know, um, prevalence there, just, just to speak in sort of concrete in numbers terms, prevalence there is very low. Um, a lot of what the foundation has done to try to address that in a sort of programmatic sense is work on the commodity side, work on the sort of stockout side, uh, developing diagnostics for understanding where stockouts happen, how, how to operationalize this whole concept of stockouts, and how to make sure that they're, you're monitoring stockouts in such a way that, you know, one, they don't happen, but, but two, it, it sort of, it's sort of links you to that uh, demand side. <clears throat> so um, small country, very youth oriented, but uh, very, very much prominent in terms of the sort of country action plans that the other working groups are, are talking about. Mm -hmm. In terms of making sure that family planning and, and the ways in which we want to conceptualize family planning in a measurement s space is more firmly entrenched in the MDGs, the, the um, 11 indicators of the every woman, every child, I would say, frankly, that the family planning indicator is kind of flimsy, you know, again. So I, I think part of this idea of a global movement <clears throat> is, is not to just talk in small rooms like this among donors and, and, and those close to the sort of the programmatic and the policy side, but really reach out to, to the NGOs who are working in the countries and who can develop community models for uh, monitoring things like Program, program quality, quality of care. I, IPPF has a strong model that uh, every, every, everyone is talking about now. S Suzanne's talking about some very strong models that, that we're beginning to hear about. I think if we can, if we can find a way to link up all, all the ideas and the best practices and sort of the current models for engaging the community in how we monitor programs mm -hmm. with that, and th that, that is in many ways where the where the rights and, and the choice dimension has its sort of natural home, then I think we're well on our way to what we might call a sort of global movement. It's not, it's not donor driven. <clears throat> it's not, it really isn't driven by the concern about the MDGs, although that certainly helps, but it's very much happening at the community level. I think the question is, well, well which, which communities are we talking about? Which countries are we talking about? Which graduated countries? I'm, I'm gonna punt that to Scott, if I can, but <laughs> but it was a really good question that Carlos raised. I mean, um, presumably we're talking about 69, you know, sort of all the all the planning behind the measurement part of the of the uh, London July 11th day was was talking about sort of 69 countries in the world with you know sort of parameters of family planning, unmet need, and uh, national income. I I actually don't think those are the those are, we've drawn boundaries around those con countries and outside, outside those boundaries, we're not gonna work or we, we're not gonna worry about ind indicators. <clears throat> I, I don't wanna make it sound like it's gonna be sort of loose and somewhat chaotic, but I, I think we're talking about family planning everywhere. Uh, the one country, to be very frank about it, the one country that there was quite a debate about, do we give this country space on the day and do we have them, was China. Um, and, you know, thankfully, um, I didn't have to answer that question. But, I mean, um, chi China, too. I IPPF has a very strong community monitoring program there. So w I think we have a lot of strength in a lot of countries 
where if we do things right and if we reach out to sort of especially non-state actors, you know, NGOs out there who have developed really strong models of community m monitoring, then I think we're on our way to sort of like engaging the mergs and the churgs out there, make, making sure they're helping drive the monitoring questions. So that, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Julie. John, the future is now. They're there, three billion of them, and it's our job to provide information and services because information is power and they don't have it just now. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is how do we get on the sustainable development agenda? This is not a closed shop. You don't have to show your card at the door saying you're a certifiable family planning agency to be a part of this. The only way this is going to work is if you open those doors, you raise the tent flaps, and, and if you work in education or nutrition or micronutrient or whatever, and if that woman or girl dies, you have lost your investment. We can't afford to lose those investments. We need to be as inclusive as we can be, and honestly and earnestly inclusive. Um, I was on the Commission for Accountability and Information, and it was a struggle. And you're right, we lost. I, I guess maybe I shouldn't say that. We didn't lose. Family planning was the number one of those 11 indicators. But we had a lot of others that we wanted to get there, but we were outshouted <laughs> by, by others. But what we did accomplish and what we collectively can take advantage of is making sure that we choose carefully what we're going to monitor and measure that we simplify where we can because that means then you'll get the information. Part of our problem in the past is we didn't get the information. It was too many, too complicated, sometimes too obscure, I think. Um, the, the other thing that we have to really think hard about, and, and it's not just one method that is going to make this possible. It's not, I learned some new language. It's not just the LARCs, long-acting reversible contraceptives, or the SARCs, which are the short-acting reversible contraceptives. It's the choice, it's the range. Different people have different needs at different moments in their lives, and we need to make sure that they have what they need to accomplish their reproductive objectives. I sat in a hot room in Bucharest and watched the world negotiate that individuals, that was the trouble in 1974, didn't want individuals, but it was individuals and couples to have the right to plan the number and spacing of their pregnancies and the job of governments to make sure that could happen. So it needs, we need to pay real attention to quality of care, to equity, to people's rights, and absolutely to choice. That's got to be our bedrock. Okay, let me um, just say something about since when had mentioned, um, turned to me on the country selection, um, I guess, I mean, I'm not speaking for Gates or for DFID, but when, um, when you focus on 69 countries, um, it would be easy to, um, for the funds to be dissipated by trying to do everything everywhere or cover all those countries. So, um, so some selectivity, I guess, um, and you know, focusing on countries that, um, um, that sh share a commitment and that are willing to put their own resources and attention behind the programs would be one way of prioritizing um, countries. Uh, and also considering uh, countries that where the highest need exists. Um, uh, USAID has done uh, prioritization <coughs> of countries. We're now focusing on 24 countries. Um, and um, um, we're reaching, um, many of those um, encompass the countries where, that have the highest need and where there's commitment already. But um, there are many more countries where USAID doesn't have a, USAID doesn't have a presence. So I would hope that the Summit partners would figure out a way of addressing needs in those countries where we don't have existing uh, programs on the ground. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say, I don't even know where to start. I mean, I think <laughs> some, some really important points raised 
John, on your question about country and the numbers and what does the 120 million mean to a country like Senegal, I mean, some of the, you have probably read the technical note. For those who haven't, I'd encourage you to read the technical note, which sets out all of this. But mu much of the work that was done on the metrics was really looking at doubling historical progress and, and how we aggregated that up to come to this 120 million overall. But it's an artificial number. We had to come up with something, and it was sensible and robust and evidence-based. It was stretching, but hopefully achievable. And it's the usual problems that we get into when we're doing anything like this, is how to set a number. And we came up with one. Is it the right one? Only time will tell. Um, in many ways, it doesn't go far enough. We know there are 220 million women with an unmet need. It's only going to reduce that by half. And actually, if we're successful, unmet need will likely rise because more women will be aware and, and want to space and plan their families. Um, it's about all the countries playing their part. Many have said we could, in theory, achieve the 120 million by focusing on a handful of countries, five or six of the big populous countries would get us there. We might have achieved the goal, but we'd have lost the spirit of what this was about, which is about meeting the needs of all women and every woman's right to choose. So we have to focus on all the countries, and particularly those countries that are ready, willing, and able to commit to this agenda themselves. We need to provide that support to them. Um, Ed, in the comment about the global movement, I mean, Jill made the comment, it is absolutely a big tent. We're still far too narrow, really. The people that we have and that we're speaking to are tending to be the usual suspects. We're bringing new people in, but there are many, many more that we need to be part of this. Um, it's pretty easy to reach out to people interested in public health. It's pretty easy to reach out to people interested in women's rights. Uh, going beyond that, we have difficult conversations sometimes with people interested in economics. Um, we have difficult conversations with those ministers of finance related to that. We need to have conversations with people interested in environment and sustainable development, and you, you pick that up. We've got to widen the tent. If we want to succeed, we have to make sure that everybody is part and can see how family planning can contribute to the goals that they're trying to achieve and also how we can support uh, their agendas. Um, Suzanne and ICRW mentioned the, the role of civil society and, and it was critically important. I don't think we went far enough. We, it was a very good start, but we really didn't go far enough. We had very good buy-in from international NGOs, those sitting in Europe and North America. We didn't go far enough and, and couldn't in the time available to reaching out to civil society on the ground to indigenous civil society organisations, those really working with women's groups at the community level. And I think that's one of the key things as we move forward and working with international civil society is how do we really make this real and sustainable in the long term? And we can't do that with a load of people sitting in London or Washington or New York. We have to get this down to country level and to community level. And there's experience of doing that and we just need to build, to build on it. Um, Carlos talked about the, the choice of countries. Again, I mean, a fairly artificial and arbitrary selection um, as aid agencies are focuses on, on the world's poorest countries. And so we chose those 69, which happened to be those with a GNI of less than $2,500 per day per capita, uh, sorry, per, per, per capita <laughs> per day. Um, it's relatively arbitrary, um, but that's where, for sort of UK taxpayers, we need to be showing the focus. But we recognise that obviously not all poor people live in poor countries, and millions of women in the world who are themselves poor are living in middle income uh, and, and more wealthy countries, and we know that inequality is a, is a massive issue. Um, we would hope and expect that there will be a, what we call a halo effect of the work in the poorest countries, both in terms of um, the work in terms of making family planning back on the, on the public health agenda and having the conversation at the global level will impact on women in, in many other countries around the world and be truly global, but also the, some of the initiatives and the work that's done on demand side or supply side barriers will also have an impact beyond the immediate focus of countries where resources will be targeted. Ellen picked up about the point on access. I mean, absolutely right. We often get caught up in this sort of view that we can solve this all by just providing more affordable commodities. And that's, we can go a long way with that, but we absolutely can't do all this just from a supply side agenda. Um, I think it's absolutely tragic that at the moment we see many women going to service delivery points and then not having the choice of commodities that they want. And we can fill that pipeline and do it fairly quickly if we all work together to do that. But beyond that, there'll be still many, many women who still won't have access in the widest sense of the word because they don't have some of the demand side barriers are, are still there and, and still preventing it. So we've got an awful long way to go. Um, you're right about the need to integrate this into the broader agenda, um, particularly into health system strengthening, um, sustainable financing. Yes, this is only 
eight years of financing that was committed. In fact, very few donors actually committed eight years of finance. Um, the UK, uh, Norway, the Gates Foundation were the only ones, and we've counted that many committed four or five years of finance. You know, the European, obviously, we didn't count much of USAID's finance because it's designed, um, agreed on an annual basis. So we hope that there will be um, even more resources as time goes on. That was committed there and then, which is not bad for, for one day, but we've got a long way to go to keep all those other resources coming in. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks. And John, I just wanted to follow up with one thing you said. I really like the, the plan of action from Senegal, and I was wondering if there's some way that such plans could be posted somewhere so that countries can learn yeah. from each other, because those that sounded good. I uh, uh, have to ignore the hands in this room for just a minute because we have um, – uh, some questions that came in from the, from the overflow rooms. Uh, one is from uh, Meg Green from Greenworks, and it says, uh, family planning is a basic human right. It's everybody's, uh, everybody's right. Are we at the point where we can t begin to talk about the needs of men and boys um, with, for family planning without diminishing the focus on women and girls? So that's one question. And uh, the second que sort of related question, I don't have a name, um, says, how are we moving forward to implementing and measuring um, the impacts of gender-based violence and specifically sexual and reproductive coercion on family planning outcomes um, and so sexual coercion in marriage? Uh, that's, a, that's a second question. The third question is from Kara Hanzak from the World Wildlife Fund, and uh, it says, how do we ensure that this large new influx of uh, funding for family planning doesn't create an imbalance uh, in funding flows, much like the AIDS, uh, AIDS funding flows have done over the last uh, decade or so, um, and, might, and that this influx of family planning funding, how can we make sure that it doesn't lead to non-integrated um, service provision? And finally, a question that, uh, can you tell us what will DFID and Gates do differently with the additional funds at the country level? So those are the questions that we have from the other room. Anybody like to anybody like to start? Uh, great questions, uh, difficult answers. Um, absolutely, the not only the needs of of men and boys, but the role of of men and boys um, was recognised, not as extensively as it as it could be. There were times where it felt like we were sort of playing buzzword bingo to try and make sure we'd hit off all the different <laughs> things that we needed to cover. Uh, and men and boys were in there, but probably, again, not as, as much as they should be. Um, but absolutely recognising that we need the, su the support of men and boys as partners to meet women's needs, but also recognising their own needs, and that has to be central, central to it. Um, Gender-based violence, I mean, is obviously, a, again, uh, uh, an incredibly important issue. It's very related to issues around... Uh, access and demand. Um, it has to be part of integrated programming, uh, and I think that's where we start to really, where, where the kind of rubber hits the road is, is how we move this forward, because whilst the summit itself is focused on family planning needs uh, and access to contraceptives, we don't want this to be a vertical program, and, and nobody's planning on it to be a vertical program. It needs to be integrated across everything from the continuum of care for MNCH, um, for broader sexual reproductive health and rights, HIV, et cetera. How that happens on the ground is, is what we all have to work out, and it's not something that we sitting in, in London or Seattle or D.C. Can, can do. It has to be, as we work through, keep that message that it, that it needs to be integrated. We, we've learned those lessons from the past. Um, what are we going to do differently? Uh, <laughs> lots and not a lot. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I guess um, from, the, from the UK perspective, we've been increasing our investment uh, in women and girls more broadly uh, in supporting progress towards the MDGs. We're very much focused on delivering the MDGs, uh, we will continue to provide a lot of our support bilaterally directly to country governments. The UK has 27 priority countries, and the bulk of our investment will continue to go to those countries. Uh, we will continue to provide core support to many agencies, including UN agencies. Uh, UNFPA is a key partner of ours, and we will continue to provide long-term support and investment through UNFPA. We will continue to provide a lot of support that we do already um, through civil society, through our partnership framework agreements at the global level, um, through civil society delivery uh, at the country level. 
Uh, what we are doing differently is working with a range of stakeholders, uh, obviously the ones gathered here on the top table today, many of you in, in this room, looking at how we bring these different partners together to really solve problems. Uh, and those problems can be anything. Uh, we don't have a clear list of what all those problems are. We have an idea of some of them. But we recognise that what we can do is, is facilitate uh, different people through our ability to convene, to, to fund, uh, and to empower different groups to really help work together to try and solve those problems, either at the global, at the national, or at the local level. And I think that's what we're going to be doing a lot more of in the years ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so those are those are very good questions. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll, <clears throat> you know, stand stand by the answers that Julia gave. But I think the one that I need to comment on is what will the donors do d differently. Um, it's interesting. We we often hear sort of two two sides of this. Um, on the one hand, you know, we're going to transform family planning. You know, you hear that verb transform. You know, in a, in a very transitive sense, transform. Um, well. You know, as I look at Julia, well, tra transform what to what? I mean, it, we've never connected those dots. <laughs> I think what that really is code language for is, you know, a lot of new energy, you know, re revitalizing the family planning field. So certain things may be transformed. Um, I don't exactly know what they are in, in a concrete sense. I think that the family planners in this room, a lot of us have been in the, in the field for, what, 25 plus years, 30 or more years doing all different kinds of things. Um, um, if we had time, we could make a very long list of, of what those practices are. A lot of those practices we were doing 20 years back, we don't even remember what they were now or where we did them. So there's a lot of really strong practice and a lot of really good models that we need to build on. From, from my vantage point, what, what I think is really thrilling <laughs> is the extent to which we can change the evidence base, cha change the contours of the evidence base again um, it's not all about the DHS. It certainly needs DHS needs to be um, needs to be there, maybe in in in, in ways that it, it hasn't been. But I really love the idea of uh, there's there's access to family planning the services and there's access to data. I think the more that we can get smart data, localized data into the hands of of, of the community. Civil society groups, NGOs, those who make choices down at the district levels, uh, that, that might actually have a good chance of, of, of being a transformational practice. So the evidence base that we have now, we do a lot of projects where we try to get the results of our surveys out to the community, but I don't think that that's enough. I think we can do more with how we use data, where the data come from, and uh, spreading it far and wide by using all of the people in this room and certainly well beyond this room to build on the models that they already have. I can even see things like a program coming up with um, how to use really good family planning data, community-based data, primary health care data, public health data for a particular area, and having school teachers uh, in introduce modules in their classrooms so that student, you know, young people, students can understand data that are relevant to them. Uh, sorry, that just occurred to me right now. <laughs> maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't, but it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that we need to, to, to really move, sort of move, moving that dial a bit with data. I think, I think that there's scope for, for real change there. I really agree with that, and I love your spontaneity of the idea. It's right on. That, that access to evidence, data scares some people. I'm not the least of them. But the fact is that evidence is just plain evidence. It's, it's why you should do something and make decisions either yourself or your community or your family. One group I want to target with our evidence are those finance ministers. They need to dip into those pockets, but they don't have the evidence so far. So that's a job for us to do mm -hmm. soon, not later. So maybe on the question of um, the funding and the influx not creating an imbalance, just to say that, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, the Family Planning Summit followed on an um, international call to action on child survival. And, um, and I see um, the donors um, redoubling efforts in maternal child health alongside of um, family planning in the years ahead. Um, the influx of funding, if you 
remember the chart that I put up, um, it represents if all the commitments come through um, about a 40% increase in resources, which is sizable, but it's not um, a doubling or a tripling that, um, that we've seen in the HIV programs, for example. Um, um, but um, the um, uh, funding puts, in real terms, puts us back to where we were in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So it's a place we've been to before, but we kind of went away from and now we're coming back to it. Um, and then uh, on the question of integration, I think if we look around um, um, various countries to see where we've seen the most success, and it often involves um, integrating services. So we know that in the cases of um, Malawi, Ethiopia, and Rwanda that have made remarkable, remarkable progress on family planning, it's been by uh, uh, utilizing community approaches to reach rural populations where the needs are highest. And it's, uh, in each of those cases, it's not just family planning, but it's, that's where the needs are highest for maternal mm -hmm. child health and other services as well. So these are integrated programs, and you'll see um, smart increases in uh, a number of indicators in these countries that adopt that community-based approach. And then also just to mention that um, an area where we think there's a continued missed opportunity is integrating family planning into postpartum services. It's when we know women have the highest need for spacing and limiting. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we can better reach women at that point in their reproductive lives, uh, we'll have uh, even uh, greater success in meeting needs. Okay, more questions here at the, the, the very <laughs> back. Oh, God. <laughs> Keep them very short, please. Thank you. Uh, I am Nagash Takluk from Ethiopia, and I will follow the last example mentioned. And really, <coughs> if, if we want to bring paradigm shift uh, in a way the family planning can be taken seriously, I think the football field should be changed my understanding. We were messaging to ourselves and we were only dealing between ourselves. But the problem we face is in the other camp. Do we convince the environmentalists to accept how family planning can support their work? Do we convince the agriculturalists, the other, the road construction, who are really taking the biggest budget in each country so that they can be positive? We were fighting only between ourselves mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. So we need to bring the family planning question in a way they understand our messaging, uh, our partnership, our integration approach. Does it reach to that level should be the critical concern. Mm -hmm. And unless that addresses in the coming eight years we are planning, I don't think uh, still will bring the paradigm shift. So my advice is, we need to focus on our messaging, our integration to the other development countries. Uh, I, I recognize the success at uh, July conference, London conference, but just before one month, where 192 countries gathered in Rio, they have different. They didn't accept the family planning up to right level. Then this is a good message that our field of fighting area should be changed and we should deal that way. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, let's see. In the orange. Hi, my name is Amy Metzger. I work at Christian Connections for International Health, and I have probably a lot more to say, but I'll keep it brief. Um, I just want to make a point that even though the Christian and faith community can be seen as an obstacle, we want to just just to reiter reiterate what Ray Martin and others have yeah. said, don't look at us so much as, as an obstacle. There's actually a lot more being done in, in family planning that you may realize. And um, we've been in touch with some of the people on the panel already, and some of them know what we're up to. So um, mm -hmm. there's plenty of examples. We have a Nairobi Declaration, which is an interfaith declaration. But you can check out ccih.org. You can get in touch with me. My name is Amy Metzger. I'd love to be in touch with many of you because we really want to bridge that gap between the faith community and what these other groups that are working out in the field because I think that's the only way we can make a difference. So, and, and because these faith communities are working, these groups are working 25 to 50% of the healthcare in these countries, it really is a missed opportunity if yeah, we don't take advantage to. of that. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Here, can you just continue up to these two and then go back around? Hi, my name is Nancy Termini, and I'm with the Population Council. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for being here today. Uh, just one point on, on Amy's question just now. Um, I think it's a great point about uh, how 
faith-based organizations and particularly Christian organizations can be a really great asset um, rather than an obstacle. Well, they can certainly be an obstacle. Um, mm -hmm. And the, you know, uh, in Ethiopia, the Population Council has done some really successful work um, with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in integrating family planning messages in a really um, palatable and, and sensible way into the teachings of the Orthodox Church um, in a place where the church is most of the institutional exposure a lot of these people had you know, at any point in their lives. Um, but my question uh, is for all the panelists uh, and touches on points that several of you touched on. Um, and it's on how can we use the summit as not only an opportunity to reinforce people's independent uh, commitment to family planning um, service and focus, but a collaborative approach. So how can we use it as a platform to build relationships among both civil society organizations and, and others um, so that we're avoiding redundancies and we're able to um, utilize each other's expertise and, um, and not only, you know, avoid stepping on toes, but really enhancing our progress, um, you know, rather than working independently, you know, using this as a unique platform. Thanks. Thank you. One more here, and then we'll take the panelists. We, the, this room is being used right after two, so we have to end right on time, I'm afraid. My name is Victoria Jennings. I'm with Georgetown University Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, I appreciate very much what all the panelists have said and, and the very many lofty questions and suggestions that have been made also by those of us participating today. My question may be a little bit more operational in nature. Um, I'm thinking about the themes about, for example, the time frame, which is very short. Uh, Ellen's comment about the reasons people don't use family planning and it isn't just about access. Um, and the issue of data sources, many of which are extremely weak, um, especially, for example, service statistics, which often are just not even, I mean, not even worth the paper they're written on. Um, but I, I'm coming this, at this particularly from the standpoint of a, of a guide that we have just completed on forecasting for new mm -hmm. and underused methods of family planning, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was supported uh, through the Innovation Fund by the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition and we'll be launching it at the meeting uh, upcoming in Paris in a couple of weeks. Um, essentially, this is getting new and underused methods of family planning into the system is a long-term process. The, the form is already printed, so where are you going to put the form when, so that the person who wants to order the commodity can actually order it. I mean, all of these things that seem so Very simple practical, yeah. and that you just can't imagine that these are barriers to getting new and underused methods in, into services. And here when I'm talking about an un new and underused methods, I'm even talking about things like, for example, an IUD. IUDs are underused methods in most of Africa, in fact, in much of the world. The fact that they're not in places in Latin America notwithstanding. So we, I think we really need to think about how new and underused methods are going to come into the system to help meet this need. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Let's uh, turn to our panelists for some, uh, any big comments? I mean, a few quick reflections. Uh, to our colleague from Ethiopia on paradigm shift and engaging others, agree, agree, agree. I mean, I, absolutely right. Same response to Amy and, and the role of faith-based organizations, absolutely clear that we need to work and we've been in contact with, with Ray and other colleagues at CCIH and will continue to do so. Um, Nancy, in terms of the importance of collaborative working, uh, absolutely, this can only be done by collaborative working. My own experience is that that works best, and I sort of mentioned earlier on, when people come together to solve a common problem, it's quite difficult to support collaborative working in a, in a productive and sustainable way, just let's work collaboratively, um, doesn't tend to have the effect that you want. You spend a lot of time talking about process and how you're going to work collaboratively without actually working collaboratively. Um, I say my experience is that we need to identify a few things, be it global, national or, or local level, or problems around whatever barriers it might mean that we need to overcome, and then get together a group of people to do it. And I think some of the way that we're working moving forward, some of the stuff around monitoring and accountability, bringing a group of people 20, 30 organizations with, a, with an area of interest. We'll need to establish more groups to think about some of the stuff around rights and empowerment, more people to access some of the stuff around market dynamics. Um, so I think what it will be is, is, a, is, is coalitions of the willing coming together to work together on specific elements, all of which together will add up to hopefully some of what we're trying to achieve. Um, Victoria, I mean, you, you highlighted a lot of the issues that we're trying to address. Yes, mm -hmm. the time frame is short, but in political terms, it's actually quite long. And you're amazing how hard we had to fight to get it to be an eight year and not a, a two or three year time frame. Um, uh, barriers, yes, and not access. 
data is weak. I mean, I think the other thing that we really need to think about for data is that we need data not only to monitor progress, but actually to achieve it. Unless we've got the evidence in place, unless we know where we're succeeding and where we're failing, unless we know what the reality is on the ground, we actually can't achieve progress. And we need to think about having that data in real time to be able to say where things are working and they're not working, not just to say, well, we didn't achieve it. I think. Uh, just a minute to follow up on that. Th th thank you so much for all, all of those questions. I'm, I'm on the CCIH ma mailing list, so whoever put me on that, thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> um, I think it's Kitty Hempstone put me on that, I, I think, and I, I think it's terrific. So thanks for very much for, for being here and sharing that concern, which I think is really critical to how we move f forward. So th thanks for those comments. Um, to Victoria. So. Um, Two things. First of all, a, a lot of us in this room have been in the trenches, family planning programs, re reproductive health programs, public health programs for a long time. So we definitely know the problems you're talking about with respect to how to change things. When there's a template that someone, government printed the template and it's, you know, it's out and everyone is waiting for it. So really, it, um, contraceptive in, in introduction and new forms of change that's easy for us to talk about actually have to be operational on the ground. Um, so we understand that, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of the hard work is just process, process, process. It's you know, building relationships. It's not being the smartest person in the room. It's knowing how to build relationships and stay in there over the long term and maybe make sure that, that, a, that a really viable process gets developed. And my final comment is that you know, you know, the Red Sea waters always part, <laughs> sorry for the biblical reference, the Red Sea waters always part whenever you bring up service statistics. This side of the room says, no way, they're junk. You don't know what you're talking about. Why would you ever invest one penny to try to improve service st uh, statistics? And the other side of the room uh, says, well, sure, you know, this, this is exactly where, where we need to be in investing, try to find out what can work. These are the data that are owned by the government. These are the local granular data. These are, 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 are the data, yes, that can help us to understand things like scale and scale up. These are the data that can inform GIS approaches to having a spatial view of data and on and on and on. And we have a lot of strong projects who are working in that domain and we just, you know, we need to get stronger. And if, uh, again, um, the, the sort of the job of a donor, uh, aside from sort of trying to reasonably set policy, and a, a lot of what I think the job of a donor is, certainly from the foundation, you know, who, where are the smart groups out there? Where are the groups who are well placed to help us understand what, where, where, where we can make investments towards these values that we believe in. Mm -hmm. So please, um, that we're, I don't have the answers, but I'm, I'm actually pretty sure that several people in this room have quite promising ones. So I'll, I'll hope that we can get that process going. Thanks. I, I also just wanted to add, I think that it's an area that we have a lot to learn from HIV, AIDS. Have, they did a lot to strengthen yeah. HMIS systems, so we can, we can take from that. Um, I just have one uh, quick question, and that is the, meeting that's taking place in New York over the next couple of days, will there be a report or how will we, who aren't there, learn about its outcomes? Uh, there will definitely be something coming out. I don't think we've worked out. Do, do um, they get onto the uh, London Summit website? Yeah, for those who haven't seen them? yet, there is a London Summit website um, that is live and uh, ongoing. It's recently, just in the last week, had the at least the first cut of the summit commitments document go up, recognizing there's still gaps in there that we need to fill, and that will con continue to be live. And anybody else who didn't uh, get to make commitments in London and wants to add their voice to that, it, this is an ongoing process. Um, as many have said, mm. this is a global movement. This is uh, a place for everybody who, who wants to play a role to have a place and, and to play that role. Um, please don't wait to be mandated by us to do it. We can't possibly think about all the things we need to think about and spend our time asking you all to do it. If you've got a great idea, get on and, and do it. You don't need to be part of the movement. You don't have to kind of go through any formal processes. Just yeah. do what you're all doing. Do it better. Do it more. Do it together. And, um, share, and share it and be part of making it happen because it's not something that we're going to sit and control. This is not a project. There is not a log frame that sets out exactly what we're doing. It's about all of us <laughs> uh, working together in the best way that we know how to do. That's great. Yeah. Um, any final words from the other panelists? Or any other final words from you? <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, so that's actually a good summary comment. I know, Julia. yeah. It's yeah. a good place to end. I think so, too. I was, yeah, absolutely. I think if, if we don't have the message now, we're all in this together. <laughs> There's not some small group making all the decisions. So uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, the panelists uh, for a really great, uh, great session and thank all of you. Sorry we didn't get a time for all the questions.